I get to take this. This is for all my friends on Facebook and Twitter. I like this. I was going to do it vertical just to piss everybody off, you know? <laughs> Thanks so much for, uh, for coming and hanging out with all of us folks today. My grandfather was a Newfoundland fisherman. His father before him was a Newfoundland fisherman, and his father before him. My family came here from Ireland in 1750, and we fished cod for 200 years. It was the lifeblood of the community. It was the culture, it was the society, it was the religion. It's what made the clocks tick. About 50 or 60 years ago, my grandfather, Frank Dwyer, and his brothers and sisters and their family, they moved to Montreal and eventually to Toronto. They had outfished the cod to the point of near extinction. And most importantly from all of that, the communities of Newfoundland reached near starvation. The idea was a lack of sustainability. I walk around with that thought a lot, you know? I walk around with the thought of, was my grandfather and his peers and his community capable of understanding the dynamics of a finite crop? I don't think so. I think they were a people guided by a different compass that thought, the sea is very organic. It will be an infinite provider. There's a heck of a lot of his stuff left. But unfortunately, they were wrong. I want to talk today about oil, because I feel oil is almost our version of cod. But the difference between my grandfather's generation and all of us here today is that we're capable of knowing we're running out of it. There's an emotional compartment to how we rationalize oil. We're either guilty or we feel happy. We look at the past and we think we're pretty great. We look at the future, we think we don't have many answers. But there's one element that oil provides to us, in my personal opinion, that is hugely important, and it's the economics of oil. The economics of oil provides one input, being oil, and multiple outputs. So we all, in our day-to-day, -day, conceptualize oil as one input being oil, and the outputs being gasoline and diesel. But oil also yields plastics, rubbers, synthetics, adhesives, epoxies, resins, cosmetics, jewelry, which for some reason is pretty important. <laughs> Everything around us is created by oil. It's something we should think about a bit more often, but we shouldn't feel guilty for the fact that we don't. The fact of the matter is that if we wish to replace oil, we have to find something that eats, sleeps, and breathes like oil, because oil is an animate characteristic of the modern human condition. Simply because it is such good business and consequently all around us. The rims on your glasses, the lights illuminating going up the side of these lovely stairs here at this beautiful center, my watch, interestingly enough, even the hybrid car, the electric car, is made from oil. It might not burn oil. We look at it in a very myopic sense. We say, well, you know, we're really doing something here. It's kind of like a Seinfeld episode. You know, you know we're really doing something here, you know? <laughs> we should be proud of ourselves. <laughs> pretty, 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 pretty good. Um, but the fact of the matter is, the hybrid car or the electric car from the paint on inwards is made of oil. It's a fallacy. Let's get beyond that idea. Let's establish that right now. The only thing that we're doing at the moment, especially in Ontario, and I think in a very macro sense across the world, is working to replace coal. Wind and solar replaces coal. What are we doing to replace oil? Bupka, nothing, nada. We're fooling ourselves. Plastics, rubber, synthetics, adhesives, epoxies, oil, da, 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 the whole thing. I think the sustainable industry needs to adhere to the model of oil from an economic point of view. One input, multiple outputs. The idea is about risk aversion. 
The idea of having one product that yields multiple outputs eliminates the risk of being in a business. Sorry, being in business in that sort of infinite sense. You have many products that work over a variety of different ranges, and it consequently pushes the aggregate price of goods down, which means you dominate and you push your competitor out of the market. The modern competition market is what it's all about. So if we wish to replace oil, we have to take the infrastructure of economics as we've built it and work within that realm, love it, eat, sleep, and breathe it, in my opinion, anyways. I think that sustainability, renewability, the green industry, call it what you will, has failed to a certain degree because we haven't determined or created a successful financial model. And I point to three very specific reasons why we haven't. Number one is subsidies. Stop subsidizing renewable energy. I'm a huge believer in Keynesian economics. I believe that when there's a slump in the economy, the best thing to do is for the government to step up and give people the ability and give companies and the economy itself the, equi- the ability to infuse cash and find its new equilibrium where things are stable again. But in the renewable industry, what we've done is create a situation whereby we're not sustaining a portion of time, we're not sustaining a product, we're creating an industry by virtue of subsidies. If we ever hope to replace plastics, rubber synthetics, adhesives, epoxies, that very long list that went along, not to mention gasoline, diesel, and coal, we have to find something that is capable of the same thresholds of the marketplace. They have to be able to compete. Nobody gets a job, unless it's nepotism, you might work at one of the big five banks here. Seems that's the way it works normally. I love that there's laughing because there's like some people who went like, I did commerce and I didn't get the job, but he did. His mom worked at Scotia. No, no, no. <laughs> um, the fact of the matter is products have to go out and compete. The modern competition market, we are the most successful generation in the history of humanity by virtue of oil because all of the products of oil work in a very competitive sphere. And within that sphere, if products cost less, people buy them. If they cost more, people negate them. And if they do cost more, that becomes an experience of wealth and affluence. Oil is the one example that brought us away from wealth and affluence. It created a congruence of of ability to procure goods. It came about as close as we could ever get to eliminating scarcity of the basic goods that we all share and need. A lot of people say that the industrial revolution created the middle class. I think it was the catalyst for the middle class. But I think that oil created the middle class as we have come to know it. The second reason why I think that sustainability has done a not so decent job is that the price of sustainable goods cost more. Open up your energy bill tomorrow morning and you'll see that the price has gone up since you did it 365 days ago or so on and so forth. It's not because of the rising price of oil or a scarcity in the coal market. It's because of renewable energy. Wind and solar cost us more. So we feel on two very basic examples. The idea of it costing more from a tax perspective or the idea of costing more from a more personal perspective in terms of what it costs to heat our homes in the winter, to keep our husbands or wives and children and grandparents warmer. The very fundamental of, fundamentals rather of economics, the idea of the Greek word for economics being ekonomia, which when translated means house management. With oil, we found a way to manage the house such that access to goods is ubiquitous. Sustainability is moving away from that. Again, if we're trying to replace oil, find a product that eats, sleeps, and breathes like oil. In the most dire of circumstances, when folks are unfortunately addicted to products like heroin, what do they use to get them off of heroin? They use methadone, because it works like heroin, but it's not as addictive. We have to treat oil the same way. That's if we're committed to getting it out of our lives. The last item is the idea that sustainable or renewable products change the way in which consumers consume whether it be a more expensive LED light or the fact that 
wind and solar costs more, or the fact that most electric cars are probably one of the ugliest things you've laid eyes on. I mean, if you really want people to start using electric cars, make them look like a regular car. Make a beautiful Lexus or a Cadillac or a Honda Civic or a whatever it is. Make it look like the other car. Why are we trying to pretend that these products have to look different? It's the silliest thing I've ever thought of in my entire life. I took the fundamentals of economics uh, of oil and I started to think, how can we start to replace it? What's a very small item here? And I thought, what's something that replicates the economics of oil. And I found the flaxseed. And I started a company called Flax Energy about four years ago. I chose the flaxseed for three reasons. One, Canada's the largest grower of flax in the world. Number two, you can't cook with flaxseed oil. When you extract the oil from the flaxseed and you heat it, it goes rancid, it becomes inedible. Interestingly enough, a Scottish guy about 150 years ago figured out if you take the oil out of a flaxseed, and you mix it with some organic resins, you can make a flooring. He called that flooring linoleum flooring. He did so because the Latin term for flaxseed is linseed, hence the name linoleum. It has an industrial precedent. It's not like ethanol where we're digging a food staple and turning it into a, a fuel. The last and most important item of the flaxseed for me was the fact that a flaxseed is made up in its organic composition of 40% oil and 60% meal. So at my company, and by the way, we're right here in downtown Toronto, the only biodiesel plant in the downtown core of a major city center anywhere in the world, and we take Canadian-grown, non-growth modified flaxseeds, crush them, take the oil out, turn that oil into biodiesel, runs in any diesel car without any modification, and that other 60%, the meal, we turn it into animal feed and flax flour. Have you ever seen omega-3 eggs, milk, beef, or chicken? That's because the animal was fed flax. If you ever see omega-3 bread, pizza, pasta, salad, dressings, biscotti, all these kind of things you might want to have as a digestif after your dinner, it's because it was made with flax flour. It's also gluten-free. My fiance is in the crowd wants me to go gluten-free. I don't know if it's going to happen. Somebody make me a gluten-free steam whistle beer and I'll drink it. <laughs> the fact of the matter is we have all of these items that coalesce. So I made a product that was uh, available. It was an organic. It was here. I could access it. Uh, it wasn't a lot of, you know, we didn't, we didn't turn the world on its head. But the fundamentals are the same of oil, as oil rather. One input, multiple outputs. So we got flax, we got food, fuel, feed. Immediate marketplaces. What's the most important thing? We didn't change the pricing margin. We didn't change the way in which people consume. We didn't charge them more money. And for the first time in probably thousands of years, we're increasing the nutritional value of flax flour, of the food that we eat, and we're reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and the price doesn't change. That, to me, is the crux of sustainability. Not charging people more. Not asking the government for money. Thank you for the clap, by the way. I should have timed that pause a little bit longer. <laughs> this guy's a beauty, eh? Here's the fact of the matter. The fact of the matter is we're capable of doing it. And I want to point to one really quick example. Paul Newman, my favorite actor. Okay, guy's a beauty. The movie A Color of Money, his character Fast Eddie Felsen steps up and he says, don't kid yourself. It has its effect. It's like those things we take for granted, like electricity. He's absolutely right. We take electricity for granted. But what did electricity do for us amongst the variety of different things that we all can immediately see? Well, it replaced the candle. For hundreds of years, people used the candle as an element for light. So think about the turn of the 19th century. A guy came along and he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the power from falling water, from steam or from coal, I'm going to harness it at the source, at the origin of where that power is being created, and I'm going to run it through a small cable. 
and I'm gonna run it down every single solitary, solitary street in the country, and I'm gonna cut down a couple million trees, and I'm gonna put them every 30 feet. And then every 30 feet, I'm gonna tack this cable to the top of that big piece of wasted wood, and I'm gonna run it into each individual house and business. And it's gonna go in through the wall, through a smaller transformer, up through the roof, down through the roof, into an element. We're gonna wrap the element in a little bit of glass, and we're gonna call it the light bulb. What a fantastic idea, we're gonna replace the candle. <laughs> and the bank manager looked at him and says, you're out of your mind, that's never gonna happen, dude. That's crazy, couldn't you imagine the infrastructure? Well, it happened. It happened. These four lights pointing on me right now are working on the same fundamental elements as that guy who went into the bank manager and pitched the idea at the turn of the 19th century. It is a small cable leading from a power source to a little bit of wire wrapped in some very fine glass that shoots it down on my awesome Scarborough shirt. <laughs> Nothing's changed. Think about it, the only item that ever eclipsed the capability of electricity was oil. Electricity came along and needed billions of dollars for infrastructure improvements. Oil came along and became the infrastructure. It is the infrastructure of the modern human condition. But we have something on oil. The economics of oil. The idea that we can replicate it with seemingly endless products. A very smart man, one of Canada's richest men named Michael Leachen, fantastic Jamaican-Canadian, talks about the idea of perception versus reality. He's made billions with that kind of philosophy. The perception of oil, of oil is that it's finite, it's running out. We hear things in the news about 30 years, 40 years, 60 years, 80 years left. Forget it. We know that it's finite. It's very much like the codfish. It is our codfish. But as a intelligent folks like Mr. Lee Chen says, don't focus on the perception, focus on the reality. And the reality of the fact is, if we take the economics of oil and start looking at products like the flaxseed and alchemizing it, which is today's topic, the idea of taking one input and creating multiple outputs, we now have the ability to replace oil. Let's think about that. Slumping economy, Meet the modern, sustainable, industrial revolution. We're all here, and as Paul Newman said in the movie The Verdict, everybody in the room is smart. Let's do this. We have the fundamentals. Cod ran out, oil ran out, the economics will always be here for us. Let's take one input, multiple outputs, and let's change the world for the better. Let's manage the house. Thank you so much.